Thank you, Adam, and hello, beautiful people of Brighton. In about 10 minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, in about 10 minutes from now, I'm going to explain how we can transform life on Earth into becoming the happiest, most harmonious, least bad thing imaginable. But first, we need to talk about the apocalypse. <laughs> 75 years ago, a group of atomic scientists came together and invented the doomsday clock. You may have heard of it, but in case you haven't, it's essentially a fun, accessible way of visualizing how close we all are to not existing anymore. <laughs> The idea being that we face a number of potentially existential threats, climate change, nuclear war, various forms of terrifying technology, and if we don't learn how to manage these risks, then the clock will tick forward to midnight, at which point, presumably, some form of doom will ensue. In 1947, freaked out by the fact that they just invented a weapon that could end civilization as we know it, the atomic scientists set the clock at seven minutes to midnight. <clears throat> and it's had various ups and downs ever since, as you can see here. In 1991, following the end of the Cold War, the clock was dialed all the way back to 17 minutes to midnight. And this is the least doomed that we have been in the last several decades. <laughs> and then, as you can see, for the last 30 years or so, I feel a bit like a weatherman here, coming in from the West, <laughs> we've been drifting in a decidedly doomward direction <laughs> to the extent that in 2020, the doomsday clock was set at 100 seconds to midnight. And there it remains to this day. So we're counting in seconds now, which doesn't seem good. According to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, a group that includes no fewer than 11 Nobel laureates, right? So these people are no slouches when it comes to crunching the data. We are, and I quote, the closest we have ever been to civilization ending apocalypse. <laughs> now, today's conference is called This Could Be Our Future. And so let's be real for a moment. <laughs> civilization ending apocalypse could be our future. It could be our near future. But the doomsday clock also tells a more optimistic story in the last 60 years or so, there have been eight occasions in which the hands of the clock have been pushed backwards. And on three occasions, we've made successive steps in the right direction. This pattern of two steps forward, three steps back, is something that repeats across many areas of human endeavor. In the world that I know best, education, there's an incredibly stubborn, hopelessly unfair disadvantage gap, whereby the best predictor of your educational success is your parents' bank balance. In recent years, we've made some headway in narrowing this gap a little, but now the gap is widening again, year on year. And this was happening pre-pandemic. It's even worse now. We might also look at life expectancy. In 1900, in this country, life expectancy was 48. It's now 82, which is astonishing, isn't it? But here, too, progress is faltering. In many areas of this country, life expectancy is going down for the first time in decades. In each of these three examples, we see a common theme emerging. We know how to make the world a better place. We just don't have the hang of doing so consistently yet. But we're in luck. In recent years, a new field of study has emerged, implementation science, which is the study of how to bring about lasting positive change in real-world contexts. I first came across implementation science, excuse me, one second. <clears throat> Does funny things to your nervous system, this red carpet. <laughs> <clears throat> I first came across implementation science about eight years ago. I've become increasingly obsessed with it ever since. Three years ago, I created an implementation science toolkit for schools. I've now shared this toolkit with hundreds of schools all over the world. And honestly, the feedback has been unbelievable. And the comments I receive most often, I wish I'd known this years ago. I'd like to share with you one idea from the implementation science toolkit, the big idea that drives the whole approach, really. And then I want to ask you the question that keeps me awake at night. The big idea 
is the Vertical Slice team. And this is something that I first came across in the world of healthcare. So in particular, researchers wanted to know to what extent is evidence-based practice, what we know to be gold standard best practice, actually happening out in the world. And so these researchers went out into hundreds of hospitals and healthcare centers, and they looked across a wide range of health disciplines. And they found that, on average, in the wild, it takes 17 years for a piece of evidence-informed practice to achieve 14% coverage across the healthcare system as a whole, which is terrible. Obviously, they're both bad numbers. What this means is that should you find yourself in a hospital, there's a remarkably high chance that you could be given a suboptimal treatment, even though the evidence exists that better treatments are available. So these researchers thought, this is ridiculous. How can we fix this? And one idea that they had was to use a vertical slice team. In a vertical slice team, you take a cross section through an organization or a community, and you get representatives of different kinds of people different stakeholder groups, if you like, sitting around the decision-making table together. So in the NHS, instead of having all the big decisions made by senior managers and senior clinicians, which is what usually happens, you have a vertical slice team, which includes some of those senior people, but also includes junior doctors and nurses, hospital administrators, patients, whoever has a valid perspective on the problem that you're trying to solve. And so you look at this problem through multiple lenses, if you like, and you write and then execute a really detailed implementation plan, often over like a three to five year period. <clears throat> so it's important to understand that this is not just a consultation exercise. That vertical slice team essentially becomes like the executive tasked with overseeing this particular policy. And so it's not top-down change, but it's not bottom-up either. It's people at all levels of the organization working in harmony toward a common goal. And we find that when you implement change in this way, you can achieve 80% coverage within three years, which is a bit more like it. Let me give you an example of what this looks like in practice. A few years ago, at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, medics became increasingly concerned about the very high levels of hospital admissions due to asthma. And so they assembled a vertical slice team to get to the root of this problem, reaching out into the community that included medics, but also included people like school nurses and pharmacists and the asthma patients themselves and their families. The school nurses said, kids are forgetful, right? They're always leaving their medication at home. So they made sure that asthma medication was always available in school hours. The pharmacist said, people often don't pick up their prescriptions because they work long hours or because they don't have a car. And so they started delivering asthma medication to people's homes. And the asthma patients themselves and their families often said, my landlord won't do anything about the damp and mold in my home. So they provided legal aid to take on the landlords. Within five years, hospital admissions due to asthma had reduced by half. And in the subsequent three years, the readmission rate reduced by half again, leading to a 24% reduction in school days missed, 30% reduction in workplace absenteeism, huge financial savings for the hospital. This is what you might call a win-win. Win, win-win. There are many examples of how vertical slice teams can bring about lasting positive change like this. But at the moment, this approach is very much the exception rather than the rule. Why? This guy, the top-down monster. <laughs> Education, health, politics all run in a very top-down way where you have a very small number of people at the top of the system, school leaders, NHS directors, cabinet ministers, who make decisions on behalf of everybody else, and then they just basically tell everyone what's going to happen now. And it's so important to recognize that top-down change can be really useful at some things, specifically when you've got low-effort, high-impact stuff. And a really good example of that is something like the smoking ban that was introduced in this country 15 years ago, fairly easy to make happen, huge positive impact on public health, great. But when it comes to high-effort, high-impact stuff, things like fixing social care or addressing the rapidly escalating cost of living crisis, or not sleepwalking into climate catastrophe, top-down change is hopelessly ineffectual. Why? Three reasons. Number one, initiative-itis. 
We know that it takes three to five years to bed in lasting positive change in a large organization like a school or a hospital, let alone a society. Excuse me one sec. <clears throat> But the people at the top of the system are rarely in post for three to five years. The average cabinet minister in this country is in post for 1.3 years. We know how this song goes. Each person feels like they need to put their mark on the office, so they come up with a change initiative, which is often a bit half-baked because they're sort of making it up on the hoof, and then they in initiate it. It's often nothing more than a lunch, a launch, and a logo. And then they leave office, and the, the thing quietly collapses behind them, and the next person comes through the revolving door and goes, I need to make my mark on this office. And the whole thing goes around again, and again, and again. This leads to a condition that goes by many names, initiativitis, innovation fatigue, or fad fatigue. This too shall pass syndrome. Teachers have this phrase that they mutter under their breaths as the latest wheeze is announced. This too shall pass. <laughs> initiativitis is horribly corrosive. It makes people skeptical and increasingly cynical about the possibility that positive lasting change is even possible. Next. Top-down change goes against human nature. Put simply, people don't like being told what to do, even when it's a good idea. This becomes apparent from a very young age when you try to do something on behalf of your child and they go, no, me do it. And this hardwired need for autonomy persists throughout adulthood. In the workplace, as we've heard this morning, people often rank the need for autonomy as even more important than how much they get paid. People just like to have a small amount of say over what they do, when, and how. And top-down change robs them of the ability to have that need met. And the third problem, the mother of all problems with top-down change, groupthink. You may have noticed that people tend not to contradict their boss even when they're blatantly wrong about something, partly because it would be awkward and embarrassing to do so, and partly because contradicting your boss in a public forum is probably not the best way to advance your career. And so people bite their tongues, perfectly understandable. But this phenomenon whereby people sort of avoid conflict in the interest of group harmony or in the interest of self-preservation leads to bad decision-making. And there's abundant evidence of groupthink leading to really serious problems throughout the years, from airplane crashes and space shuttle disasters to the financial crash of 2008. There was plenty of groupthink in evidence throughout the COVID pandemic too. And often these decisions are being made by very intelligent, highly capable, well-qualified people. And it's a good idea to have such people in the room when you're making big decisions that affect many people's lives. But what you don't want is to only have well-qualified, highly intelligent, capable people in the room. What you also need is to have people who are looking at this problem through fresh eyes. And what you really need is people who are willing to ask the stupid questions. Because when somebody says, can I ask a stupid question? What they often really mean is, is it just me? Or is this a terrible idea? <laughs> Vertical slice teams provide us with a powerful antidote to each of these three problems. And as we've seen, they can be hugely effective. The school leaders and teachers that I've worked with over the last few years tell me that once you've implemented change in this way, there's no going back. Why? Well, firstly, you just come up with a much better policy to begin with when you've looked at this problem through multiple perspectives and you anticipate problems in advance and you solve them in advance. You just come up with a much better plan in the first place. Secondly, people throughout the community know that they are represented on this vertical slice team, that there is somebody like them with whom they can interact throughout the change period and who will stand up for their views and interests. And so you get buy-in like never before, and you harness the goodwill and the energy and enthusiasm of people to drive the change through with you rather than just sort of becoming compliant and feeling that like they have to dance to the latest tune. And thirdly, Vertical slice teams work with the grain of human nature rather than against it, recognizing the importance of autonomy and giving people voice and choice. And there is no better antidote to groupthink than that. <clears throat> One moment. Which brings me to the question that keeps me awake at night. In fact, it's a series of questions, and they all begin with the same two words. What if? 
because we face so many of these high effort, high impact challenges at this point in time. And I don't know about you, but I don't see anyone in power or anywhere else with a clear implementation plan that's going to deliver us in a step-by-step -step way from where we are on this precipice to the more harmonious, less hair-raising state of world affairs that we all know is possible. There is a version of life on Earth that has the most amount of joy and the least amount of suffering. If we so choose, we can use the tools of implementation science to dial back the hands of the doomsday clock to half past six in the morning and transform this world of ours into the happiest, most harmonious, least bad place imaginable. By way of a final word, I recently discussed this idea with a professor of political science because I wanted to know, has this ever been tried before? To my amazement, it hasn't. Truly representative, people-powered politics never been tried. Anyway, he'd been nodding along, and he seemed to agree that vertical slice politics would be better than what we have currently. And then I said, it's a bit ridiculous, isn't it, to think that we could actually make this happen? And I thought he was going to agree, but instead he said something really interesting. He said, that's what people always say about progress, ending slavery, women's suffrage, creating the NHS. At first, people say it's impossible, that it would never work, that it's naive to even suggest it. But then something remarkable happens. One day, it doesn't seem impossible anymore. Suddenly, it seems inevitable. And at that point, people will come together and make it happen. So, what do you think? Do you think vertical slice politics is impossible or inevitable? Or are you somewhere in between? And wherever you are on this spectrum, I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Because it's 100 seconds to midnight, folks. And the clock is ticking. And the house is on fire still. We're in a tight corner. And nobody's going to fly in to save us from ourselves. So let's pop the top-down monster back in his box and implementation science the shit out of it. <laughs>